Hi, Ankit. How are you? Hi, Joseph. Good morning. I'm good. How are you? Yeah, very good. Thank you. Thanks for joining Randstad Technology Digital and Data Podcast. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to have you on. Um, why don't you introduce yourself and uh, we'll go from there. Sure. So as you know that, uh, my name is Ankit Gupta. I'm currently uh, working as chapter lead at Spark New Zealand. I started as a developer in my career and slowly transitioned into a DevOps consultant and finally land up at, her, at Spark New Zealand and working as a chapter lead uh, at Spark New Zealand for DevOps tooling. My role consists of um, uh, it's horizontally spanning across the teams and uh, we are working a lot with the teams and ensuring that we're providing right tooling and the process so they can excel in the technical perspective. They can build faster, they can deploy faster, they can work and we can have proactive uh, monitoring analytics and the security parts as well. Good. So why, that, why did you move into DevOps? Kind of what attracted you to DevOps? So, uh, uh, you, you, this is something which is uh, the same thing. Like people were like, okay, uh, what are you working on? Okay, you're working on Java. Okay, have you heard of the DevOps? Uh, no, I will start reading about it. So then I start reading about the DevOps and all those things. Then one of the, uh, the fascinating thing was in my, always in my head was to join Google. And when I joined and I opened the career website, the first job was the DevOps engineer. So then I thought, oh, I have to learn DevOps. Then I started building that DevOps portfolio. And then uh, when I was a developer itself, I had an opportunity to work on a platform, which was uh, that whole idea was to enable the DevOps practices and the compliance and all those things. I think that was the start for me. And from there, there was no back. Uh, and that uh, always uh, jumping into different roles and all are related to DevOps. And I think it will, the DevOps, as you know, that it will keep on growing and there is no, and it's always a circle kind of thing. Like it's an infinity loop. Like you have to keep on evolving and all those things will keep on going. Yeah. So, so what is DevOps then in your opinion? Very tough question to be honest, <laughs> but uh, I will start with uh, what I, uh, uh, what I will give a definition. Like, so DevOps is the combination of the uh, culture, philosophies, practices, tools that increase an organization uh, ability to deliver the applications and services at high velocity. Now there are various definitions. This is one of them, but what I believe what DevOps gives to us is the basic three fundamentals or the three principles. The first one is the DevOps methodologies and second is the DevOps technologies and the last and the most critical one, which I have like I've been practicing and I'm ensuring that anywhere where I go and where I'm talking to the team and everyone understands this DevOps shared ownership model. So the biggest change in the, uh, this, uh, the, any other previous software models or development models like waterfall or anything and the DevOps, the change comes in the shared ownership model that you actually start sharing that ownership and it bring an end to end team together. And the whole team is responsible for taking and designing, developing and taking into production. And even also after it is live in production, maintaining it, that's the critical path here. Mm. Shared model. We'll, we'll touch upon that in, uh, in, in just a second. Um, and we'll go into a bit of detail about those three areas more. Um, what was, when you first joined Spark, um, what was the environment like from a DevOps perspective? Can you just elaborate a little bit more? on? Sure. So uh, when I first joined Spark, uh, um, I started evaluating a lot of teams and started understanding what's going on. It was like almost for a month, I was just being an external uh, a person and was just observing how the practices are going on and I was actually designing what it should look like and all those things. Then I found uh, uh, initially all the application application teams were in the silos like in any any other uh, organization enterprise one in back in those days and uh, uh, there was no central code repository. One thing which was the first thing which I found it was a lacking uh, perspective over there. Every team was managing their own sort of code repositories. Uh, their work management system for each application team was different. So uh, there was no, again, no transparency or I will say visibility was not there for any other team. So if there is a dependency, it is only the mail trails has to be formed and people has to follow up multiple times instead of they will not able to see the progress on the real time. So that was the, uh, the, the biggest gap I found when I joined and started looking around how we can fill that. Mm -hmm. And what was, um, 
what was the uh, what was the environment like from a trust perspective? You said shared trust. What can you just go into a little bit more detail from that from that side? So. Um... So the trust perspective comes in, um, if you see the same scenario is there, like when you don't have a, a, a proper system, which will give you the visibility of the work in progress, then uh, it, was, it was more over like what any one specific person is saying or a responsible team is just representing, yes, yeah, we have done this and all the stuff that, that, con that kind of the conversation was there. And moreover, as it was a siloed thing. So as I mentioned that every application team has its own silo. So, uh, the operate there was a clear uh, demarcation between the responsibility for a developer and operation thing so the handover was happening between the developer and operation there mm -hmm. that trust factor comes in like because operation and, and that's where the the nature of job comes in the developer are supposed to write the code faster and faster they are supposed to build functionality faster where operational person or the operational readiness thing they want to ensure that anything goes into production should be ready enough or should not break any production so there was the gap and that was the point where things were slowing down and that that's the same thing. And that's where the DevOps comes into the picture in any other area and just comes in and help you to build bridge that gap by building the trust as well as providing those tools and the functionalities so that uh, people can trust each other and build that and take it together. At this point in time, because how many years ago was it when, when you joined Spark? Just, just clarify that. Uh, it, it's uh, if I be, if I remember it correctly, it is almost three years before. Right, so, three years. So, uh, yeah, almost three years before. So it was the situation back in there, and then we started working day and night on this, and we were able to reach uh, at least a certificate or position today. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. how 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 important was automation um, at that point when you joined? How because um, automation is you know, this is a bit of a buzzword right at the minute. What sort of automation practices did you have in place that to, to make things a little bit easier? So first thing, it is a key driver and uh, was, so you, you have to understand automation is a key driver for the DevOps. As I mentioned that DevOps technology and the DevOps tool, which is one of the principle, which I mentioned in the, uh, in the first for the three. So that refers that you have to build automation and integrate into the process, which you are taking end to end. So, and really automation is something which you have to start thinking about. There are various factors that how you will uh, take that some automation scripts or you build some automation which can expand further. So when you are building the automation, you have to start understanding how you will integrate. You are not creating any dependency on something or any vendor or any tool specifically. So there are various factors you have to start looking around. And if this particular orchestration tool changes, for example, you use any orchestration tool for your CI/CD pipeline, it could be Jenkins, it could be Azure DevOps, Circle CI, et cetera. So if any changes comes into the future, if your organization decide to change to one platform to another, your automation or your scripts, whatever that uh, the, I, the IP you are building should be ready to take off from one platform to another. So that decoupling has to come into the mind. At the same time, you have to ensure that they are serving the purpose and providing and the feeding information which is required for both developer and operation people over there. So when we started uh, on this journey, we started with uh, assessing the what language uh, we start writing the scripts. And um, initially, and that, it's a learning path, to be very honest, and it's a really uh, a lot of good learnings on the way comes in. So we started assessing that which language we want to take on and it all depends our criteria as well that what skills we have available, how we are going to maintain it and how it's going to work and what all those things are available and all the stuff. Uh, and that was the thing. Then uh, we picked up one language, started working on and on the way we found that uh, we need to work based on the application. It is not like you just take one model and it is the same thing. It's not only about the automation. It's about any other thing as well. You cannot take a single model and you say that there is a handbook I'm giving to you, this application team one, you can start following this. And the same handbook will not work for application team two. So it's the same thing comes into the automation stuff and the writing your scripts and all the definitions. So you start transforming the things according to the requirement. And uh, so one one uh, one of the system, which was the legacy one, which we had still in the environment, and we wanted to automate the deployments and the builds on that particular one, we have to go for uh, the the the, uh, the languages like Perl, Ruby at that time. 
and, uh, and and the reason being is because that integrates quite well with the tool which we were doing and we were handling it through the automation so it completely changes based on your requirement what tool you are uh, dealing with what kind of automation what kind of uh, the tasks you are looking forward and what flexibility do you need so once you have defined this criteria for you then you start picking up your framework for the automation and the in the basis the basis is the same that you want to follow some process for automatically building it and with no touch point you want to deploy it in production so if you take that in your mind and start building that all the steps all the way then you will find your way good thank you for explaining that um we wanted i wanted to get an understanding of that before we move into the next part because the, I know that Spark have been um, going through a bit of a transition, especially when I first came to New Zealand about two years yeah, ago, yeah. and they adopted the Spotify model, the Agile practice. Um, yeah. How did this kind of new practice influence and affect DevOps and, and, your, and your chapter? Can you just elaborate a little bit more on how yeah. that works? So uh, I, will, I will share uh, one of the, the slides which I have with me just to explain what the model was and how it has transformed and how it make difference. So uh, that will give you the better clarity actually. So I, I believe you are able to see my screen. Is that right? Indeed I am. Yeah. So this was, so you know that as you mentioned that the agile transformation, you have heard a lot about uh, in the news and everywhere. So what actually has happened, uh, and this is a, it's very high level overview, which I'm trying to show here. Mm. There was a, a lot of silos as an application teams were working. As I mentioned that this assumed that this is an application one, an application two and application three team was working around. They were working in their areas. I will call them as an island. So they were having their own islands, uh, small islands each and everywhere. And they were just working and trying to deploy. And then we having the issues as well and all the stuff. With the agile transformation, what happened is it transformed into an end-to-end -end squad. So what does that refer here is that a end-to-end -end squad or a squad will come together with all the required person. So if you need some person from the orchestration, you need someone from the billing, you need from the web development, you need uh, any, any specific capability or the skills from a particular chapter, they all come together based on the requirement. They've been given a requirement. The product owner actually helped them to do prioritizations and all those stuff. And that's where from that particular model and they actually build, they take it uh, to the production and accountable for that as well. And how that actually also, that, that something is an end-to-end -end squad, but there was a people around, which is uh, for each chapter. What does that refer here is that a particular skill set or an application team was bound, binded by a chapter. That is a vertical, vertical thing here. So this is, if this is a squad and this is a chapter, that that's how, there is a combination of squad and the chapter works in there. And you have agile coaches, you have the product owners and the tribe leads available on that one. Does that make sense to start with? Yeah, it does. It does indeed. Please continue. Yeah, cool. So what happened after that is initially we had a uh, single teams, as I mentioned, then you have become end to end squads. So one of the major thing and the transform and the requirement come through when it has moved is that you need, uh, so the, now you have made the teams which were able to build faster and have the capability to deploy, but now you need uh, to enhance on the testing perspective. What does that mean is you have a lot of other teams, a lot more, many more teams now, which is having required an end-to-end -end environment. So that's where we started building the end-to-end -end environment capability and testing as a service, where we say that, oh, so I will say test environment as a service. So what does that mean is for a particular squad, you will just pick and choose from a catalog that I am going to build these systems and these systems can be stubbed. So it actually build an environment for you. It has a mixture of containers. It has some mixture of the VM based one. It has stubbing over there, some database masking comes into the picture and all the stuff happens. And the magic magically it builds an environment for you and provides that where team can deploy their changes and test it before they merge it to the integration environments where all the other squads are also pushing before even go to the any pre-prod staging or um, UAD environments. So that was the major uh, change altogether, not only in the, the, the way the culture perspective as well as the technical perspective that we had to invest a lot in building those kind of capabilities where we were able to provide those environments to the team so that they can test their changes and can proceed further. 
another thing which maybe i will be like to touch upon was on the because now initially it was when you are building into one of the particular island kind of scenarios it was easy to do the audit and the compliance whereas when you go into the end to end squad where people are free to develop and all those thing and you have a faster development going on the auditing phase has been like uh, it been difficult so in the waterfall model was designed in a way that you actually stop for a phase called as an audit once you pass it on then you go ahead but in the ci cd or i will say devops model you're not supposed to stop and that's where we have to start working around that how we automate this compliance perspective as well how we automate uh, that uh, the security part as well how we do an automated auditing and give early feedback to the developers so they can start acting on them before even they touch into the integration environment and all those thing one of the amazing uh, 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 analytics or uh, uh, the insight i want to share and this is something which uh, has been published multiple times as well but what happened is uh, on the particular uh, perspective is that once we found that we have given started giving early feedback to the users or the developers we found the the defect number of defects into the our integration environments or the staging has started reducing and at the same time the incident has started come uh, lower down into the production as well so this actually uh, nails down the cost of fixing the defects in the incident so that that's where so it's an initial investment which any organization has to spend over money on it and building those capabilities but once you reach there you actually find out uh, the long term benefits around it yeah no thank you for sharing that ankit um i think spot was one of the first kind of larger businesses um that i was aware of that was adopting more of an agile way of working and it's certainly uh, you certainly reap in the rewards now as a business i know it's it is maturing and but it's not perfect but hey it seems to be um producing a lot of benefit uh, for you guys over there um the next thing that i just want to touch upon is you know how you as um within you know how you as a leader within the devops team have navigated the transition from monolith monolithic architecture to microservices and uh, some of the challenges that you faced um from from that side of things can you just take the the audience uh, on a little bit of a journey about how you kind of navigated that please sure so uh, before we jump into that we need to understand that microservices offer a unique kind of modularization like the, the they make big solution easier and increase productivity and flexibility in choosing any chosen technology so uh, as uh, in the agile model when we have end to end um, scores and all those things so there was a requirement coming up or the fourth coming up was that um, we needed a sort of our applications to behave there we can deploy faster with a minimal impact of end to end system and the solution for was for that particular requirement was microservices so the buy in perspective it was easier for us that okay the the requirement was understood and we understood that yes if we want to move to the way that we want to deliver faster to the market we want to deliver faster to our customers and we want to ensure that with minimal impact to any of the services so uh, the microservice was answer for us and we started working on that transitioning from uh, uh, like monolithic applications to the microservices and we picked the very first one is our integration layer where we started working around um, taking bits and pieces and it is again this is something which has to be start, uh, understand again in a way that it is it is not going to happen in one day i mean to say if you start thinking that today you take it up the monolithic and okay you decide that i want to convert into the microservices is not going to happen so you have to plan it properly because uh, any application which is running in the last 10 years it is quite stable and if you're touching it we have to ensure that you're building equally a stable system and you are trying to gain more agility and flexibility to deploy and all the stuff but at the same time you don't want to ensure or you want to ensure that your operational things are working fine as it was before as well uh, with minimal impact so you have to start planning out so what we did is at the same time we started planning out this is our targets for this quarter this many services we will take it into the microservices one and building it and uh, so and and this journey still continues be very honest and it's a long way um, because as you know the spark is a, a it's a, a enterprise having a lot of applications and uh, i can't like you can imagine any of the applications and we will have some instance running somewhere for serving some purpose 
So all those scenarios, so actually trying to cover all those things and ensure that you have a, uh, a same way of mechanism out of the performance as well. So that's where you start planning out, picking up the system. So we picked up the integration layer first so that we can actually do the changes on the fly when it is required, because that was the system which we thought that it is changing quite frequently. So, and then we picked up the, the front end layer and all those things. So it's it, again, as I mentioned, st journey still continues. Mm. So, and we are still working around that. Sure. Um, what provisioning and infrastructure as code is starting to come up a lot, I find. Can you just explain what provisioning, what provisioning is, please? So um, I think you're touching upon in the same perspective that the way we are having, we were having the issues in the past, like as in, so uh, like you build into the microservice now, oh, I have the microservices where I should deploy. And that's where the problem start comes in, oh, how I will provision the, my infra on the fly as well, because mm -hmm. that's where the flexibility comes in. So this is the same scenario. If I pick up, if I have built a Java code, if I build a micro, small microservice, if I take it to production, what all the steps involved? And that's where the infra provisioning also is a part of it. So um, a very good point you brought up and we started, uh, and, and we soon realized that as well, that we needed uh, something and automation around the infra provisioning. And what we did is we built our custom layer and we built our custom templates around it and we started using infrastructure as a code. So, and with the transition to microservice and using containers has helped us a lot in the whole journey as well, where we started understanding what does that uh, uh, like container look like, started giving and started using those containers, some of the applications, and we found a lot of benefits of using it like uh, the benefits around uh, deployment, you can actually do on the fly. So a good example is initially, um, if I say a couple of years before the deployments or anything happens in the nighttime and now almost all the deploys in the daytime and, and peak is 11 a.m. in the morning when every customers are reaching to our sites at the maximum time. Because mm -hmm. now there is a trust over there because we have a zero downtime deployments and that's all possible because of the microservice infrastructure as a code and the container thing. So, and why you need infrastructure as a code as well, when you have the containers in the fly, because a uh, container automatically contains a definition of how it has to spin up, what kind of resources has to be assigned, but not all the application. This is something very critical that everyone should understand. You cannot containerize everything in the stack. So it is, it is not like it's technically impossible, but moreover, you have to understand that containers are meant for the lightweight microservices and all the stuff. You will still have some applications which is being hosted on a, a, a virtual machines or some dedicated hardware and all the stuff. Can, can how we can get the benefit of infrastructure as a code to spin up an environment? As I mentioned in the end to end score that the, uh, from a catalog teams picks up, I need um, say for example, these applications, I need these tubs over there. So when they pick and they say that I need my front end, I need the billing system, I need my CRM system. So actually it happens, it, it is a combination of some of the container services as well as some of the virtual machine, uh, some of the application which is running on the virtual machines. So that's where the infrastructure as a code and the container capability combines together and gives a view or gives a flexibility to spin up an environment on the fly for you. And it also benefits for you to scale out and the scale, scale up kind of scenarios as well. Mm. You mentioned a few words that, um, one word in particular, a container. What, what is a container? Um, because they, this, is, this is something which a lot of businesses now um, are looking at in terms of finding people who have containerization knowledge, such as Docker, Kubernetes, OpenShift, et cetera. Can you just explain to the audience what a container is and just elaborate a little bit more? Sure. So uh, the, the, very, the very first thing is that um, containerization is a form of an operating system virtualization itself. So it's, it's nothing, it's just like if I... Uh, give a VM to you and you spin up your application over there and that that's where uh, it's a virtual machine. Just a second. Oh, Something we've got some technical issues. <laughs> Come back, Anke, eh? <laughs> you've, been, you've been sat so still for so long. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sitting on the same place and some IoT devices kicked in and <laughs> it is happening. Uh, no worries, you're back, you're back. <laughs> So we the were container. on the container. Yeah. So container is a standard unit of software that we package up as a code and all its dependency and applications runs quickly, reliably, uh, and for one computing environment to another. So the whole idea was, uh, if I, if I talk about on the container perspective, idea was that you package 
everything into one sort of image or you can say an artifact and you keep on spinning up that particular one so assume that if i give you the uh, the five machines over there and you install your applications on this particular machine and the second machine third machine and fourth machine and if you do an os patching and there's a difference in the versions and the dependency that may cause an issue in the higher environment so to overcome that the the idea was that we will package everything including the operating system and the dependence in and everything into one kind of image and artifact and image we call it and that we will that will go along the way and that's where the container comes into the picture that image or that particular running entity is a container over there so uh, and and docker is a very famous one docker created the industry and standardized the container and so they can be portable everywhere the idea of the container they should be the lightweight one they should be secure and can be spinned up on the fly anywhere as an i mean to say after having the guest uh, base os and all the stuff so that was an idea of the containerization over there mm -hmm. another another thing which i picked up on when 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 we've met is around um how spark are trying to take practices from software development and implement them within a telco environment and one of the things which you elaborated on a lot is the benefit of an sdn and um, what is an sdn and what are the benefits uh, of an sdn for, for your team and devops practice cool so uh okay as as i'm as we discussed before as well when we met as about uh, taking the advantages of what we have done in the it world to the network world the first to understand what happens over there so in the in the network world you know uh, you might know that um, we have purpose built hardware and we actually just say for example for any particular function you have a purpose built uh, a particular uh, equipment which get installed into the data centers or based on the sites and everything and then can be used over there now if we have to spin up or we have to scale up on the fly so for example there is a rugby match today evening and we know that everyone is going to stream on that one so we need to increase that capacity for a particular instance it is not that easy you have to over provision all the time so the whole idea of uh, taking the concept of virtualization from it stack to the network is that because as in the it i mentioned in the containers you can scale up scale out uh, faster as as per the requirement and you can define uh, you can spin up a test environment on the fly as well you can define what you need what you don't need and all the stuff and we need the same functional functionality in the network way so that we can reduce our operational cost as well as we can provide better functionality to the customer faster in a secure manner as well that's where this whole capability of uh, vnf cnfs or virtual network functions the container network functions and sdn comes into the picture there is a log a whole big area of this uh, uh, telco cloud capabilities and, and every telco in this world i think so it's talking about it nowadays Mm -hmm. and uh, with more uh, a lot more with the 5g thing coming in because in the 5g it's going to be uh, a, a lot of uh, devices like iot devices and streaming devices going to be connected like autonomous cars and all those thing and there we have a requirement of network slicing and all the stuffs come in the picture so that's where this whole capability of uh, network functions virtual network functions come in the picture and the sdn is uh, one of the backbone which supports all those thing so sdn by sdn we actually provisions the these things faster quicker and that provides the capability to us and when you talk about the benefits the benefits are centralized network provisioning so you have a central mechanism where you can provision a network from one uh, central place to all of the data centers all the mm -hmm. sites and everything and um, the another major benefit comes into the more granular that that's why I keep on focusing is the granular security so you get more secure way of deploying the things and managing the things from the network perspective as well so you have more control on the stuff that uh, so you have more patching happening or you have more versions updates are happening so you have ensuring that if there is security risk you are covering that and there is a paved road for you as in this it world in the ci cd capability give what it gives you a paved road that you can actually deploy anytime so if there is a vulnerability detected today uh, detected today you actually fix that or developer raise a pull request and you pass all the automated test cases it actually ready to go to the production at any point in time so mm -hmm. that's the same functionality which we can actually use uh, you, uh, by using the vnfs and the sdn capabilities and can use in the network area and mm -hmm. which nails down to the lower operating cost and you know that every organization wants to reduce the lower operating cost 
and that's the major driver here actually so uh, and another thing is uh, the content delivery so as as we grow into this area and the content side and uh, we we actually start working around um, more and more streaming happening so uh, you know that more and more devices are getting connected you have um, more and more people are tuning to the live tv or the uh, we'll say streaming platforms mm -hmm. so you actually ensure that you're delivering the content because you are able to provision the things on the fly or the based on the capacity and the demand as well so as i mentioned about the rugby world cup so you know that you need to have more capacity you actually can over provision or you can provision extra capacity today for today thing and you can use the same hardware tomorrow for something else but that's the whole stuff here and the capability and again we can discuss a lot more about it later oh, on loads more yeah it's a fascinating it is a fascinating, yeah. it is a fascinating area i was doing a little bit of research a couple of weeks ago and yeah it is it is a fascinating area so SDN, um, it's it's something which is certainly uh, we can we can spend a lot of time talking about. You touched upon there about the introduction of five G and um, the security. Just the final uh, the final area that I do want to touch upon and just pick your brains about is around the five G and what if anything Spark have been doing to prepare for that uh, and make um, the network and you know what you guys are doing over there more secure and around kind of DevSecOps and maybe what DevSecOps is. Um, so yeah, if you can just explain a little bit around about Spark, what they're doing, and what maybe DevSecOps is, I think I think that'll that'll finish up nicely. Sure. Uh, on the five G perspective, you might have heard Spark is rolling out five G. Uh, a lot of sites has been rolled out already, so you have seen in the news as well. So as uh, we are working day and night to ensure that we are always ready for the five G, working on the new technologies again. SDN, VNFs on all those capabilities and uh, ensuring that we are delivering the network functions or the network uh, things, which is we were uh, talking about before, faster and in secure manner and can deliver to the customers faster as well over there. Coming on the DevSecOps side, is, um, so I, I, this is something which is an, another area of interest for me and I keep on uh, telling people and, and a lot of people ask me what I think of Dex, DevSecOps. So when I, I talk to even the leadership here or even uh, talk to my peers here, I just keep on exp explaining them. According to me, DevSecOps is nothing. It's just a, a process or an effort where we want to secure by default. So we want to ensure that we, whatever we are doing is in a secure fashion on the secure way. And we're following on the secure practices and all those things. And the another question I'm being asked, and it is, uh, it's, sometimes it's weird, but being asked, why do we need to follow the DevSecOps and why there is a need for the DevSecOps? So, <laughs> I bet you're like, <laughs> yeah, I was like, okay, uh, still, I, I keep on discussing and say that because, as I mentioned before, with the CI CD and the continuous delivery, continuous deployment model on the DevOps model, there is no phase or there is no stopping, actually. There is no way that you can stop for an auditing perspective and you cannot spend months to do a testing on the pen testing on a particular thing. And that's not only the one problem. The second problem is now the development is happening faster and you have end-to-end -end teams sitting over there. So you have more to test. That's the main thing here, actually. You have a lot more to test and have to ensure that uh, people are... Uh, you have to ensure if you're doing the manual testing, still manual security testing, you have to expand on the resources. And at the same time, it is time consuming. So that's where we need to ensure that we follow the DevSecOps practices. Then uh, the, the last question I'm being asked that, okay, I understand what is uh, DevSecOps, why we should do it. Now you tell me how to do it. And that's again starts coming in. Okay, there is no single definition how to do it. As I mentioned before as well for the DevOps also for automation, there is uh, the definition of applying any security practices or anything. It's based on the application and the requirement. What kind of testing you are doing? What kind of development you are doing? Based on that, you define a framework or that. But if I give, if I have to give a principle around it, that what should it look like and what you should follow? As I mentioned before, as I'm keep following the, my three principles for DevOps as well was DevOps methodologies, DevOps technologies, and uh, shared ownership. Uh, so I, I, I include security into that. So I just talk about securing DevOps technologies, securing DevOps methodologies, and uh, include security in DevOps shared ownership. So make security as well also as a part of uh, the ownership with everyone, like as in everyone's responsibilities to ensure security. 
starting from a designer perspective, like an architect to start working on a design and start thinking about the requirement itself or uh, anyone, just start thinking about what is actually it's going to impact. Do what kind of security area we should start looking around. And as well as in our sprint plannings, we do involve uh, security people as well as security experts. So they give advice on that, what kind of security area we have to start looking around, where we have to start investing on the security perspective. Do we need to spend time on the pen testing on this one? Do we need to do this kind of testing and all the stuff they give it out there. Mm -hmm. So that's a very good starting point for the DevSecOps to start understanding where the uh, security requirements are coming from. The another one we should start looking as, and I, I keep on telling people is say, uh, the problem with the DevOps uh, technologies is that now with the iterative and the fast deployment, you have more to deploy, more to test. So, but the solution for this also is DevOps and the CI CD. Like, so you integrate the same practices and the tooling and automation into the CI CD and it gives you more opportunity as well. So for example, uh, now we, if I take an example of Spark. So if I say three years before there was, or I will say three to four years before there was one window in a quarter. So there was one opportunity for you to do any patching. There is a one window for you to do any upgrade of the vulnerability found or any library update and all those things. But today it is a paved road. You can do multiple times in a day. So you find it today morning 10 a.m. You fix it at 11, you can deploy at 12. So it, it's that's where you have an opportunities now. So you have more opportunities. You can be secure by default now because you have a paved road to reach to the production. You know that what to do. There is a clear cut defined path for you. And there is no hefty approvals required as far as yes, you have passed, you have done all the compliance check, you have ticked all those things, your test cases are passing, all those things are doing an automated way, it, it's all, uh, you're ready to go. And at the same time with, with this adoption of the cloud and all those things as well has introduced the risk, but at the same time, they gives you the benefit as well because you can standardize your practices, you do an auditing on top of it. So an auditing becomes easier here as compared to the previous one. And, people, and a lot more and it, like say community also keep on contributing to it and just telling that what vulnerability is found and all the stuff. So, and another big thing is on the shared ownership. It is not only just sharing ownership between the, the organization or between the squad. I, I keep on telling it's sharing with the community as well and interact with other companies as well to understand what they are doing, what is the best practices they are following, what we can adopt from them or what we can share with them that what we are doing is that something may be helpful for you. And it is all about the sharing the knowledge and ensuring that we all collaborate together and going for a secure, I will say by default secure world. Has any other companies given Spark um, any tips or ideas? Just can you give us an example of kind of that shared knowledge and how it's benefited Spark or how Spark have benefited maybe another business? So it's, it's uh, uh, definitely again, as I mentioned that we keep on discussing the ideas and all the stuff. We do interact with a lot of our uh, partners as well. Uh, taking an example, Microsoft. So, um, we, like we do have a lot of uh, a partnership along on the, along the way. The Microsoft we do share. We discuss ideas. What we think is that something we need in our environment. What they think they have seen in other customers' client areas, or what they have implemented. So we keep on sharing, and then we have implemented. So, uh, for example, uh, you might have heard of. There is a Microsoft security code uh, analysis tool available. So they have made it available recently. So that's where we were using it. Like, so that's where what practices they follow and the compliance thing. So we actually, those learnings sharing and all this thing happens and, and we implement it over there. Uh -huh. Got you from the, from the pit boys. Well, hey, Anki, we went, that was a really detailed answer, actually. Thank you for sharing. I can definitely rest easier at night knowing that all this is going on at Spark. But um, Anki, thank you very much for your time. That's everything that we've got time for today. Um, until next time.